Welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversations. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program today a dear friend of mine from about a thousand years ago, I would say, or so. Uh, that's Robert Blome. He's uh, talking to us from uh, another place in the uh, on the planet, but it's up near Toronto somewhere or Erie or something. And he's Fort. going to be talking to us in great depth for two hours uh, with a concentration upon his life but also with particular concentration upon the, uh, the, the uh, about his experience and understanding of the country of China, which he has a unique understanding of. He actually can speak the language and so forth. And Bob, it's so good to see you. Welcome to MNN one more time, okay? Yeah, thanks, Harold. Yeah, great to, great to be with you. Okay, young man, explain yourself. We met about, what, 25,000 years ago. We met a long, long time ago. And you're a little bit of your own personal background. You, you come from the Hewitt or something or, or the family and so forth. And you've also been associated with Columbia University. So a little bit of a grounding of yourself. And then we'll talk about, uh, we want to get into great detail about the country of China and the way you see it having been there for uh, over a decade. But explain yourself, uh, where you were born and raised a little bit and that kind of thing, okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, ha Harold, just 25 years, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, I mean, that in itself is an eternity in yeah, yeah. <coughs> internet time. Um, I was an older student at Columbia. We met at a lecture uh, given by Ellie Moom, a uh, re renowned uh, IT, uh, IT expert, and he invited me for my first interview, and we've done many since. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ellie Moom is a giant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his wife yeah. is wonderful. Yeah. She's got a very important position at the mayor's office and so forth right, also, right. yeah. That's but a, anyway, that's a real strong uh, um, New York City couple, those two, yeah. But anyway, uh, I was born in Trenton, New Jersey. I'm from the uh, uh, family closely connected with New York history. It's the Cooper Hewitts. Uh -huh. well, I'm from the Hewitt branch. Uh, my mother was Helen Bradley Hewitt. Uh -huh. The Bradleys from Bradley Beach, New Jersey. Her, uh, her, uh, her uh, uh, grandfather was... Uh, Real estate developer, grand, grand uncle was a real estate developer, and uh, and uh, he developed the Asbury Park uh, area, area in New Jersey. But anyway, the Cooper Hewitts, you know, the Cooper Hewitt Museum, they were pioneers in the iron and steel industry in the U.S. And the plant was the Trenton Iron Company uh, in Trenton, New Jersey, which is uh, you know where I was born, sort of last of the line, so so to speak. Uh, the uh, that 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 was at at the time that the U.S. surpassed Britain in iron and steel production, uh -huh. and notably the Trenton Springfield rifle, which helped win the Civil War, was manufactured there. Prior to that, uh, the North depended on England for gun barrel iron. But uh, Abram Hewitt, great great grandfather, who became mayor of New York and uh, also was in Congress, defeated Tammany Hall to, to capture the uh, Democratic Party. Uh, he went over to England disguised as a worker to steal the formula for Sheffield Iron to make the Trenton Springfield rifle. So, now, Bob, hey, listen, that's could family you, background. Could you, could you try to talk a little bit slower or something? Because we're getting a little bit of feedback on your voice. Could you try to uh, slow down? Is that what do you think? Yeah, that, maybe too close to the mic. Maybe too close to a mic. Oh, too close. Yeah, maybe. Let's, yeah, just okay. Uh, turn. How about if I turn down the audio a little yeah, bit? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think no, that's I can't. Right. Actually, I can't do that. But I could move the mic away. Yeah, is okay. this better? Yeah, I think that is, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, it is. And we want to hear your dulcet tones, you know, because it was coming out sounding like Donald Duck, kind of. And we don't want you to sound like Donald Duck. We okay, want you to sound like Bob Bloom. So, so this is good, right? Is this good? I think it's be much better now. We're, we're in business now. Okay, we're now I, I got another proceed. test. Let's try this. Does this sound any better? No. Okay. Okay, so this is better, this right? This is a test. This is better, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, now roll. So, so you want me to talk more slowly also, right? Well, okay, yeah. It seems to be, it seems to, it seems to have, I think you're coming through with like, 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 clear. Clear. yeah. yeah. Now, okay. say something. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, Harold, yeah, to answer your question, 
It's been more like 25 years. Yeah, so. right, right, right. So that's an eternity in the dog years or internet time. I hear and you. It, we met when I was an older student at uh, Columbia University at a lecture uh, by Ellie Nome, who was a, a, you know, Ellie, a, a Ellie Nome, yeah. famous IT, uh, uh, IT expert. And uh, uh, you mentioned Cooper Hewitt. Yes, I'm a descendant of that family from the Hewitt a uh, branch of, of, of the family. My grandmother was Helen Bradley Hewitt. Bradley is the Bradley who developed uh, at the Asbury Park area, Bradley uh, Beach and so on in New Jersey. Yeah. But uh, uh, Cooper, Coop, the house of Cooper Hewitt was important uh, for the, uh, in, uh, in the development of the iron and steel industry in the U.S. So the, the plant was in Trenton, New Jersey. Yeah. That's where I was born. And uh, the Trenton plant, uh, this was a time where uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, surpassed, uh, just before the U.S. surpassed uh, the U.K. and iron, uh, Britain and iron and steel uh, production. And uh, it was also where the Trenton Springfield rifle, uh, the gun barrel iron for the Trenton Springfield rifle was manufactured uh, that helped win the Civil War, it armed uh, the northern, uh, northern troops. Mm -hmm. Uh, the North had depended on England for gun barrel iron. England favored the South for cotton. So Abram Hewitt, my great great granduncle, went to Sheffield, England, disguised as a worker, to steal the formula for Sheffield uh, st for Sheffield iron, and uh, and uh, he gave it to his brother, my great uh, uh, my uh, my great great grandfather, and uh, who manufactured and said, if you can manufacture this uh, to a quality acceptable to the War Department, you can build a house. And that house is still there in uh, New Jersey. But anyway, that's my background in terms of where I, I was born in connection with New York history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And now, uh, I was I was at Columbia, uh, you know, as a studying graduate economics, so in the graduate school. You did economics, right? Yeah, you, you took your degree there in that, is it right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh -huh. So, PhD program. And, uh, you know, prior to that, uh, besides having an MBA in finance, uh, as an undergraduate, I studied philosophy and mathematics. So, I uh, have that kind of background. Yeah, you've had a wide ranging interest, haven't you? Roamed all over this world and so forth. And uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, and it's been a long time. So good to see you looking well and everything like that and everything. Yeah. And now, I, you know, in terms of career and so on, I, uh, I, 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 uh, I was involved in banking for a couple of decades before I went back to school and went to Columbia when I met you. So uh, uh, I had a banking and investment, and particularly an investment banking background. Uh, and I was, t uh, and uh, lately I had uh, advising Japanese power utilities. I had worked for Japanese investment banks. And at that time in the 80s, uh, the 80s particularly, and into the 90s, Japan was in the position that China is today. Yeah. So they had a capital surplus and so on. So I helped circulate that capital surplus by financing uh, 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 governments and uh, banks and uh, companies there, particularly the ones in Canada, and particularly Canadian governments from the federal government <laughs> to provinces and so on. Uh, then I got involved in mergers and acquisitions, M&A, and purchase of uh, Canadian companies and <coughs> uh, industry strategic to the Japanese. But then the Japanese economy uh, kind of uh, uh, fizzled, so to speak, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, uh, we also had electric power deregulation. And I, uh, because my clients uh, for the Japanese investment banks were often Canadian utilities like Hydro-Quebec, as well as Canadian <coughs> government like Quebec, uh, I had something to say when uh, the Quebec separation problem arose, the separation of Quebec from Canada uh -huh. in the mid-90s. And uh, that's about the time that we met. So uh, I'd written several op-eds in the Wall Street Journal to prove that uh, separation of Quebec from Canada would not be feasible economically. And uh, at the same time, power, de power deregulation was part of it because Hydro-Quebec was a central part of the uh, Quebec industrial state, so to speak. So uh, uh, that dovetailed into power system deregulation. And that's when we met and we had a few programs <coughs> on the marketization of the uh, electric power system. 
Yeah, I remember it well. Yeah, yeah. And then I advised Japanese utilities. They were interested in doing in Japan what we did, what we were doing in North America. So I advised all their electric and gas utilities. But then their economy, as I said, their economy really trickled into the you know the two lost decades into the early 2000s. Yeah. And, uh, then the Chinese were uh, came. That's that's when I noticed the. Uh, the, chi the Chinese had a presence in North America, so I began to advise them. And at that time, they were interested in reform and were interested in restructuring their uh, what had been a state-owned uh, single power system into an industry of competing utilities. You know, and so that's that's uh, it's during that time that we had our initial interviews and so on. And, and that was the reason I went to China. I went to I was in China for ten years, from 2005 to 2015. What a checkered career! That was an amazing uh, uh, understanding you have uh, behind you in terms of understanding China, which is a major superpower in the world now. Well, yeah, there, you know there was a lot of hope. They were interested in foreigners. They were interested in, uh, uh, in doing the right thing to develop a strong economy. You didn't have the, you didn't have the sense today where they're they're uh, they're focused on a single strategic goal, and so on to make China great or whatever you want to call it. They were interested in knowing how to do things right. And, and uh, but uh, not long after the time I came there, things started to change. For the work. I wonder if you could back up just a little bit there now, because we had a Second World War relationship with Japan, which was a little bit uh, adversarial, to put it mildly, and so forth, in the Second War and so forth. And what has been the traditional relationship between Japan and China, let's say over the many decades or centuries even, in terms of that part of the world? Uh, could you fill us in a little bit on that? I mean, it's it's not very well understood by many of us here in the United States, but or we could also maybe lump into that since it's re relevant now uh, the, to Korea. Uh, the, that part of the world. What are the relationship between the parts of that part of the world that you can maybe make clear to us in terms of what they are as it relates to the the West or to particularly the United States? Well, you know, the, the history of the relationship with Japan between Japan and China is a little complicated, but uh, yeah. uh, you know, at 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 base, at heart, the, the Japanese admire uh, China for being the origin of you know China, of Japanese uh, culture and civilization. Is that, is that is that like we do with at England, maybe? China. In a sense, that's right. Well, okay. you know, and, and Japanese uses Chinese characters and so on, although they're, that true? Okay. They're, uh -huh. they're pronounced differently and so on. Um, but, uh, you know, that's relationships. Then there was a time that China tried to invade Japan on the Genghis Khan and so on at work. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, Japan was, <clears throat> China was never strong in, in maritime affairs anyway. So, uh, uh, in, you know, we have the war experience, unfortunately, it lies, well, first of all, we had the, the, the war, you know, the, tur the turn of the 18th, sorry, the turn of the 19th and 20th century uh, 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 conflict between Japan, uh, the, between China and Japan, and so on. But the uh, Chinese reform or democracy was, was, was germinated in, in Japan. Uh, Sun Yat-sen, Although he was educated in Hawaii, you know he did much. Yeah. A lot, of the, you know the, you know when they overthrew the emperor, the imperial system, development of the Republic in China, a lot of it was done in, uh, in Japan. But Japan went, you know, through a, a kind of, uh, you know, militaristic uh, development like Germany and so on, and uh, and expanded and uh, and took over and abused China. So so the memory of uh, and didn't treat the Chinese particularly well. Yeah. And uh, that memory lingers among uh, the Chinese, except the Communist Party uses that to sort of, you know, bludgeon Japan over the head. And, uh, you know, to this day in China, there are many cable TV channels 
at any given time, you can find uh, a war a war group on uh, about the Japanese war with the Japanese. So it's just still a constant theme. I remember you can figure out how old I am. In the 1950s, we had programs like The Big Picture about World War II and so on. You know, yeah. you still see those in China. They still haven't gotten over World War II. So, but that's convenient. But Japan was responsible before the U.S. got involved. The Japanese were responsible for a lot of the modernization, industrialization in the post uh, in the reform era. You know, the post cultural revolution and so on. But it's sort of no thanks. And the Chinese, uh, some Chinese industrialists or uh, companies, uh, if if the Japanese wanted to advise them and so on, they they would exact what was called a kind of war premium. In other words, you have to pay extra. You have to. The Japanese would have to pay them an extra bribe in order to get the business and so on. And that extra bribe was considered like a premium for abuse during the war. You know? They called so, bakshis yeah. in Africa. Yeah, yeah. bakshis. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so things aren't very good now. Now, what happened with the U.S. is in our occupation of Japan, we were very nice to the Japanese. So the so the Japan so and, and actually uh, under under MacArthur uh, the, a lot of Roosevelt sort of uh, social democrats had influence in Japan in structuring the Japanese system, which has a, a you know, some 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 of those elements of, of, of social democracy and so on. Uh, we have and, a little bit of an audio problem, don't we? What do you think? Is there any way we can try and... Yeah. Is there anything you can suggest? No, that's finished. Okay, we'll have to, we'll have to try it. We're, the audio is a little bit uh, jerky. Would that be the word? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. But we'll have to persevere, Bob. But um, the audio what? seems to be... Uh, if you could put the mic a little bit further away from your face. Hold on a minute. Because what you're saying is really interesting. We want it to be. Hold look on. at these wires. They're all over the place. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, wires. Okay. I, I have a different idea. Hold on. I'm going to. Okay, this. go ahead. You're a very, you're a very, you've always been a very ingenious man, more than anybody else I know. I mean, you get a spot and like then you pull a thing and get a new way of doing something and it would How's really work. This? Well. Is this better? Well, let's see. Go, say something and we'll know. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking now. Is this much better? I think that sounds much better. You sound like dulcet tones now. You know Rather why? I like think the bullfrog. other thing may have been rubbing against the material or yeah, something. Yeah, something like that. Oh, this is the real bloom. This is the real bloom. Now, okay, are now we okay pontificate, now? Mr. Bloom. Really talk with those dulcet tones. Okay? No, I know. Do we have to? Should we start from the no, beginning? No, no, let's go on. No, I don't. Okay. It'll, it'll be okay. Let's just start on from there. And what you were saying was very interesting. But that's an interesting part <laughs> of the world, and you seem to understand it from a, not only a um, <laughs> political context, but from a, from a business context as well. That part of the world, China, Japan, uh, Korea in a sense, uh, and it's bo it should be well more understood because that's a major part of power structure of the world. In fact, now, China particularly is becoming a major world power, is she not? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. But unlike Japan, China has an army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Japan has self-defense forces are developing that and so on. But uh, China, the Japan didn't have to, you know, consider the bur too much the burden of a defense budget, uh -huh. like like the U.S. did. But China, China does and. You know, China does pay for that, but China also uh, poses uh, a, a challenge because uh, it's a fully, you know, it's a fully equipped state, uh, you know, particularly from a military point of view. What, what now, is the what is the history of China? China's had a rich and rich history going back, many contributions and so forth, and um, now under the under the current system. It's what is the political reality of, or, or the history of the political reality of the country of China over this century, let's say, or the, the end of the last century and into the current? 
What is the political reality there? Well, let, let me conclude the, the previous explanation by saying, you know, the, the, the U.S. was very good to Japan and so on. And, you know, Japan, in a sense, developed of its own. The U.S. empowered uh, Japan. And so relations have been very close, paradoxically, although we fought the war with Japan and were allies with China. Mm. Now, but China had a, had a, had a, a, a market revolution and so on, so it's a complicated business. Uh, the, I think a, a key point is, is the imperial system. Okay. Explain. The imperial system lasted for, lasted for a long time. The Chinese are very proud to say it's uh, 5,000 you know, 5, years. Uh, the, the Japanese respect the imperial system just not so much as a system, uh, but as a, uh, as a social economic system, but out of, as, as a re reverence for the emperor as a kind of personification of, 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 of Japan. In, in some sense, like the British monarch. Ah, but, I see. Okay. All right. And, and since the revolution, the, the you know Meiji Revolution in Japan, the imperial system was uh, it was overthrown. It was rejected. It was considered uh, well. It, it was actually I shouldn't say it was rejected. It, it was rejected. The imperial system was re, was re, in a sense reinforced in Japan, but uh, not as uh, as as a, a protector or an assertion of an ancient uh, socio-political arrangement. Okay, it was a tool, it was a vehicle for modernization of Japan. Okay, okay. right. But in China, the imperial system w was that kind of vehicle. Although, as well, the Chinese uh, realized that they needed to modernize in order to, you know, in, in order in order not to not to be, uh, in order not to collapse, basically. So, so they grudgingly industrialized, and so and uh, and so on, and and built railways, and went to the West to get educated, and so on. But uh, the imperial system, as such, never represented uh, a spirit or an idea of uh, of, of, moder of modernization. So what we have today in Japan, in Japan, we don't have the imperial system any longer being the uh, enabler of modernization, industrialization. It's purely a symbol of the, the you know, of the Japanese, sort of a, almost a spiritual thing, the Japanese nation. Whereas in China, the imperial system represents everything. It represents a system of government, the government, there's a whole cultural baggage with that, and a whole social system and a mentality of control. So I would suggest that that has never changed. So. Uh, you want the, the attempt for uh, the Chinese attempt to uh, to develop a modern democracy or republican system failed. You know, it, it, it uh, fragmented, and so on. And then you had the Japanese occupation, and so on. And then you had the, uh, the uh, then you had the revolution, and so on. And uh, but you know, once the revolution was won. The state was still operated by the same bureaucrat, in many cases by the same bureaucrats who were there under the emperor. That's interesting. Yeah, really. Uh -huh. So, uh, so, yeah. so, you still had this sort of, uh, you know, central, central, centrally controlled bureaucratic system, and to, to a great extent inherited from the imperial, uh, you know, from the imperial system. And uh, although since then. China has gone to extremes from the uh, Great Leap Forward and the uh, disaster starvation after that and the Cultural Revolution. You know, it's gone into a, it went into a reform era where, and notably, by the way, Marxists, of course, rejected, ostensibly rejected the cultural baggage that came with the imperial system, but they kept the control, they kept the political, uh, the, polit the political and administrative. Uh, 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 element of, which was sort of diminished or or, or diluted uh, during the during the uh, post-cultural revolution reform and so on. So that's where you had this era of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, modernization, you know, further modernization, reform, reform of the economy, opening the economy, opening the society, except for one thing: no political reform. So that's except been the biggest for, problem. Except in, in for one. 
Except for one thing, what did you say? No political reform. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. No political reform, no change in the political system. So it's still this sort of imperial system that we call that, you know, the, you know, the imperial entity is the Communist Party and so on. And the emperor would today be Xi Jinping, selected to the system and so on. And uh, so in that sense, you still have a continuation. And when Chinese talk about 5,000 years of history and so on, they're you know, they're emphasizing that particular aspect that hasn't really changed. And that's what's causing the, uh, the, the tension that we have now, because you have, uh, uh, you know, you had the evolution of the system in the Soviet Union and so on with the Communist Party dictatorship and so on. And, uh, and, and so that's, that's, uh, that's making China unique among large economies, large nations. It's not a, it's it's a it's it's a focused dictatorship. It's like a single company, in a sense. It's like a giant company focused on a you know single strategy and so on that mobilize the resources of the country to pursue a single goal. And like normal large yeah. normal large countries don't pursue a, a concerted national goal. They're Census. There's a lot of change and so on. The, the countries cooperate and so forth, but not, uh, you know, not the uh, a, a singular, a singular focus like you and deployment of resources like you have in China. Uh -huh. But I mean, would there be a recognition of uh, the uh, Karl Marx kind of idea of communism as it re developed in the Soviet Union? A certain kind of a uh, an alliance of thinking in terms of political principles and so forth? Or what's the relationship between uh, that and China? Yeah, so here's the story. You, you, there's a thing called RINO, R-I-N-O, Republican in name only. You've uh, heard of that. Uh, so I have. China, in China, it's MINO, M-I-N-O, Marxist in name only. That's interesting. Spell <laughs> no, it out a little bit, though. Yeah, so right. what you have... It's something closer, <coughs> to, oh, something me. closer to uh, the fascism of Europe in the 1930s or in Japan, mm -hmm. and so on, that you have that kind of system which has socialistic aspects. China calls it socialism, but it's socialism in the sense that the state is in control uh, of, the, so they're, they're of, of strategic industries and so on, and of the overall society, not the state. But the Communist Party, and so what you have is a Leninist system. So when you look at the at the at the larger Marxism Leninism, the Marxism part is there in the form of state control, but that's that's supposed to be an interim stage. The Chinese uh, Communists say they're in the construction phase of socialism and so on, uh, and uh, they're not. So anyway, so there's this el that element of Marxism as regards the state's role in the in the economy, uh, but the rest of it is there's no Marxism at all. Uh, it's uh, it's sort of in, in some some ways wild west capitalism and so on, and uh, 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 and 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 but but you have Leninism. Leninism is the key. Key thing, which is this focus on control, uh, where the party is uh, su supreme, and basically, uh, the Leninist cons you know, there's the, the, the Leninist idea that the party decides the truth. There's no such thing as objective truth. It's what serves the cause or serves the revolution that decide that determines the tr truth or falsehood of anything. So. Uh, it's the uh, it's the uh, it's it's giving the state this this giving the state this absolute power or the notion of state dictatorship that's very much Leninist. So so China is very much a Leninist country, but not so much Marxist country other other than in the uh, you know state con state control of key sectors of the economy, and uh, the Leninist uh, part also. Uh, seen in and the overall coordination 
of everything to a singular goal, sort of top-down, uh, top-down authoritarianism. So China right now is emerging as a great, uh, a, a great world power, is she not? Oh yeah, but the issue is how permanent is that, and how how much was how much was real, and how much was fake, and you have to look at Japan. Uh, uh, Japan, Japan. It looked like Japan was going to clean our clock. Uh, when I say our clock, meaning the U.S. and so on, and it didn't turn out that way. Are you and talking why, post Second World War? You're talking. You're not talking about. No, we're talking the about 30s. the 1960s and 70s. Okay, all right. Yeah, right. 70s yeah. and 80s, basically. Mm -hmm. Actually, from, from the 60s, post war, get, get through the 1950s, recover, and then begin to take off. Yeah. And uh, of course, you know, Japan has many aspects that are also considered socialistic. There's a sort of consensus approach to management and so on. And, and 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 so forth, and some collusion coordination issues, but uh, but the one problem: demographics, birth rate, and so demography undid the Japanese miracle in the sense that it didn't force Japan to go back, but it prevented Japan from progressing further. Wow! So Japanese population, no population growth, actual population decline. Wow. Inability to absorb immigrants, although they have, you know, there are a lot of Brazilian Japanese who have been, have been an episode of uh, uh, Japanese emigration to Brazil, and then Brazilian Brazilian Japanese going back to Japan, particularly in the auto industry and uh, and so forth. And uh, 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 you know, so Japan's up against that wall. So, so they, you had the lost decades, the 90s, uh, 2000, and so on and zero growth or, and so on. But keep in mind that when that happened, Japan was already at a high level of development and so on. So uh, it's, it's, yes, Japanese are biting the bullet, but their way out is to reduce costs, cut costs, and so on. And so uh, the Japanese population isn't hurting. The situation in China is similar. China's, in a way, repeating the Japanese experience, but on a much larger scale in terms of uh, in terms of population. But they have a big problem with the same population growth problem. Not the Chinese doesn't. China can't absorb multiple nationalities, which it had historically. Yeah. North uh, South, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the birth rate. You know, like 40 odd, 35, 40 odd nationalities in China. Wow. But the, the birth rate, the birth rate, uh, 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 tapered off partly because of the of the one child policy. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so the one child policy looked good when China was poor and had too many people seem to be uh, a dead weight on the economy. But now having a population is a ticket to continue. Having population growth is a ticket to continue economic growth, and China is not there. At the same time, China is not, it's, it's lower middle class. It's not at sort of middle class or upper middle class where Japan is, that China is going to face, is hitting this wall, when at best, it's at, on average, it's lower middle class, or just possibly emerging into middle class. And the, and the, the lower part, of the, the poorer part of the population who are encouraged and told, Wait your turn. Wait your turn. Yes, you know the leaders and so on. Yes, these people are getting rich initially, but your time will come. When their time doesn't come, uh, it's it's it it it'll it'll be difficult. Uh, so uh, uh, it 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 won't be that that Chinese on average will be living as well as as, as Japanese do, and that's going to create problems uh, in China, and and we're already seeing it. Now the issue is was the growth. Genuine, and there are issues about statistics and so on. This gets back to to Leninism, and what serves the interest of the party and so on. And fake statistics, or what are called fake growth. Many experts believe China's actual growth rate is only half what is purported to be. And and the emphasis on construction. This is the biggest anomaly uh, uh, or. Uh, 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 is in, in, in Chinese policy that it's the economy is oriented toward construction, 
building capacity, investment, yeah. but not toward consumption, not toward usage of assets. How to use assets? No, nobody, the party doesn't pay attention to that. Every the most frequently used word in party publications is construction. Everything's construction. From the end of World War II, China reconstructs and so on. They have but some empty. They have some empty housing projects. That that's exactly in. what I'm leading yeah, up to. Yeah, yeah. That, that a lot has been built. And so on, and it's and it's empty. And yeah. and of the apartments that are purchased, they're in they're they're basically purchased as investment. Yeah. There aren't investment alternatives. They're Chinese stocks, but they go all over the place, and it's right. not and it's a market that's become artificial in the sense that it's a policy. It's not a real market. It's a policy. The government intervenes and so on in the worst case to prevent you know uh, uh, terrible crashes. And so on. So the, that that's not a great opportunity for the public. The only thing left is property. So people just keep putting their money and property where so you have this overbuilt uh, and so on. So there's a tendency for, uh, and not only that, all a lot of that property is built has to be replaced after about thirty years. Yeah, it's not built to last. Having never been used, maybe having never been used, maybe. Or well, yeah. and also right. maybe, but maybe. it ages. So it sounds like 30, parts of Manhattan, you know, but there are well, parts of Manhattan like that, yeah. 30 years later, the, all those buildings at Shenzhen, for example, these towers, are all going to have to be replaced. So China's going to have to go through another boom in order to, like, tear down and replace these buildings that are basically constructed to last about 30 years and so on. So, so here's the point. Is China destined to, to a, a, a Japan uh, uh, outcome where everything remains flat, no more growth? Or is China going to have to give back fake growth? In other words, that a lot of the growth that we've seen in China has been fake. Empty buildings and so on, construction, bridges to nowhere and so on, overbuilding, overbuilding. Has that been no another... Has that been in other parts of the world as well? Or is it particularly gross, that kind of tendency in the country of China? I think it's more so in China because China, because that's the party's mindset. Right. It's deliberate, it exaggerates that. But, you know, similar processes, you know, we, we have in Brazil and these other developing economies that, that reach the, the, uh, the uh, 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 that reach a kind of plateau, the middle, middle, so-called middle income trap, and so on. Yes, China has to contend with that, but the middle income trap doesn't involve necessarily having to pay back, having to give back fake growth. Mm. So it's it's not that uh, uh, there was there's not necessarily that there was an exaggerated, exaggerated emphasis on construction as opposed to usage uh, and, and so on. But yes, that's the case in Canada, I mean in China. And, and, and when you think about usage, you also think about things like governance and so on. How do you do things? Uh, what's the method? There's, there's not a lot of concentration on that, on, 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 on method and how to do things and, and so on. So developing a, 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 a business, in other words, you build things, you build property and so on, without consideration about how is it going to be used, yeah. what what need, what, what what demand does it fill, and so on, what need does it fill. These big projects, now it has Belt and Road Initiative, no feasibility studies. Another shortcoming in China is the province is doing what the central government does now abroad with this uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. It, 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 no feasibility studies, just, yes, uh, to meet, uh, as I told you, China's managed like a single company. So all these officials, they have to show they contributed this much growth and so on. But we did this many projects, but nobody cares about whether those projects made any economic sense. There's no research done. There's no market research done to see, is this a feasible type of business? Will this, you know, will this be used and so on? No consideration. What are the, uh, what are if you the, get agreement, if you get investors, you get agreement, put this project together, just go do it. Yeah, and yeah, so this yeah. is, 
It's, so the, this is the ground where Wild these are, West, yeah, yeah. It, like well, the old Wild the, West, the, yeah. Well, okay, Corral, just, yeah. These are the seeds for fake growth, what yeah. I call fake growth. So what I'm trying to point out yeah. is China not only will, does it reach this plateau or no growth, it will actually have to give back the fake growth. In other words, China will have a future of negative growth, that there'll be a contraction where all the fake fake growth and this overbuilding and so on will stake out and so on. And that's really a, a not a happy prospect. Now, let me mention the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, yeah, after do, by all means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the financial crisis, okay? Up until the financial crisis, China was st still, with all the certainism and so on, it was moving in the direction of opening markets and so on, and they joined the World Trade Organization and so forth. But they still tried to practice mercantilism and manipulation and control, all centrally coordinated, which you can't do in a way, in a in a in a democracy or in a, in, a, in, a, in an advanced uh, in a, a, a democracy in an advanced economy because it's too complicated. People don't agree to that extent. Okay, so but in China's case. Uh, 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 it's the um, the uh, uh, financial crisis of 2008 had a big impact. It had a big impact all over the world. Yeah. Well, but it Including had a big United impact. States. Yeah. It had a big political impact in China because okay. the opponents of reform and so on, and the the the, the ex exponents of of the old the old ideas and so on, used that as a tool to to point at and say capitalism has failed. The reform route has failed. We have to go back. We'll go back to the old methods. We'll reinforce central control. We'll reinforce the party. We'll reinforce Marxism, Leninism, so to speak, the talk. Yeah. Marxism and Leninism, yeah. but it's basically I mean Marxism, but it's basically Leninism. Yeah. And and uh, 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 and, and so that's what's happened. So there's been a retreat and reform, and and we'll emphasize state control, you know, the the state of enterprises and so forth. And on top of that, China's tool to get out of the consequences of the low, you know, the low growth. It it the the financial crisis itself didn't have a direct impact in China because China's economy was sufficiently isolated, its financial market was sufficiently isolated from the West, but it lost in terms of exports. I saw the port of Shenzhen right after the financial crisis. I was in Shenzhen, the whole port was empty. There wasn't a single ship in there. You know, it was very, you have all these container ships, you know, for yeah. thousands of containers and so on. There was nothing, it was dead. So that was a big shock to the Chinese economy. No exports, all these other economies were affected, not importing anything. So the Chinese built more projects. They, they, they reverted to construction, construction, more projects, bridges to nowhere, and so on. And they did another thing. They came up with this thing called Belt and Road Initiative, and that was, that was a way to export their way out of low growth. In other words, exports, net exports add to GDP, add to, add to the economy, economic growth. So what does China know how to do? Construction. So the Belt and Road Initiative is a way to do, is, a, is a, a, a means whereby China is exporting its construction know-how and its construction equipment. Yeah. So it, it, it finances projects around the world without feasibility studies and so on, where it can hires Chinese workers to do it, so it's one of the employing this excess Chinese labor. It finances it and so on, and it exports the equipment that's being used to carry out those projects. So it's just a big export promotion program, one of the classic tools that developing economies use to get out of a rut caused by a, you know a decline in demand for their for their export so 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 this is the yeah. this is the, in, in other words these are the you know I'm describing what I consider to be what I consider to be the seeds of this uh, of, of, of the of this eventual giving back 
by China of fake growth. Uh -huh. and, and, and in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative, it, it would be defaulted loans and so on, despite, and uh, with, together with China's attempt maybe to take over assets in those countries. But, you know, in the end, if you owe money to the bank, you can, you're in control. It's not the bank that's in control. So uh, that doesn't look good, in the, you know, the future. So, so, so this is where China is a, is a, is a, has become a big challenge to the rest of the world. Yeah, you were there for about 10 years, is that correct? You were out there? Yeah. You were living there, and I remember you picked up and went. It was a big move on your part. It must have been pretty uh, informative and uh, educational <laughs> experience to live through that and so forth. And now you've picked up the language and you understand the culture. And what is your overall feeling for your time and your sense of uh, relationship to the country of China, having put a decade of your life uh, experience into that particular part of the world? Well, as I say, I went there in 2005 to give a speech. I was invited, and I stayed. I taught at the Electric Power University, later at the uh, Central Finance University, uh, and so on. And just uh, you taught just, it where now in in China? The Electric Power University. Electric Power uh, University. Yes. Electric power is a major. Uh, element of a national economy, yes. Uh -huh. Well, well let, me, let me say this. The Chinese education system, the uh, higher education system, was built around industries. So they originally had universities. They'd have a chemical university, an agricultural university, electric power university. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oil and gas university. And so that's since been diversified. Now, all those universities that have those specialized names, Yes, they still have the strength in that area, but they diversify into, you know, become universities as we know them to be uh, mm -hmm. diverse, and, you know, multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, I taught it, uh, and I and I stayed, and I started writing articles, for example, in the China Daily. The type of art stuff I would write in the Wall Street Journal, they were interested in that at the time. I was writing. Uh, I was writing columns. So there's one article I wrote for the Wall Street Journal that wasn't accepted, and I just changed it a little bit. To, not to say that, uh, you know, China's doing this thing that's wrong, wrong, wrong. I was telling them, why don't you do this thing that's right, right, right? Saying the same thing, in other words. That got published. They published that in uh, China Daily. So I was writing for the China Daily where the government policy was to favor market-based solutions to problems rather than administrative solutions. And prior to the uh, change, this is post-2008, uh, around 2010, 2011, so I'm already there. I've already been there five or six years. The, the government changed. And this was a dramatic thing when the current, uh, pre current president, Chairman Xi Jinping, came into power. Everybody thought before that this guy was going to bring in more reform. But the opposite happened. And I, I was even, you know, China Daily was even preparing to offer me a regular column to write. The same things I would write in a Western publication and so on. And that all stopped on a dime when she was appointed. And uh, and they uh, they said we're not we're not having any foreigner contribute articles to the China Daily anymore. We're going to do everything in house, and so on. It was very clear uh, that uh, the the reverse was the, the reverse was 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 going to happen in China. So uh, and so that that turning point was was about was a, was about 2011. And, uh, uh, and during the remaining years, uh, it became increasingly clear that foreigners and uh, you know, are, are not welcome in, you know, are not welcome in China as they were before. Foreign ideas were now viewed as a threat, and so on. And uh, party centralism, loyalty to the Communist Party, and so on. These things were these things are what would be emphasized. So. But you, so were, that, you were integrated into the culture, and you related to a number of people within the culture and within the political class as well. You, you, you were 
in association with the means of uh, information, uh, television and so forth with the country. Yeah. And what was your overall feeling as you saw these things developing? And why di did you ever have the idea, I'm going home to Brooklyn or back to New York City or something while you were experiencing all that, uh, that, that, that what was that which was going on in that country? I, just I wasn't thinking ahead in those terms. I was there. I, I was there. And, and, you know, I, in the early part, I thought every day in China, there's something new, unexpected. It did That's seem that way to you. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but uh, it, and we did some interviews on that. Yeah. And I thought, look at these Chinese. They want everything we do. They want a house. They want a car. You know, This all was great. Until this politicization entered into, you know, Entered, entered into the uh, reality, uh, uh, in, into the picture. Yeah. So after it's, it's it you know, not the financial crisis happened, but you know, Chinese leadership doesn't react on a dime. It doesn't turn and suddenly. It took them a couple of years, a couple of years to shake out within the party and so on, where it was decided that we're going to they're going to reverse. And uh, and that that part that was you know that that was very disappointing. So prior to that, I had the idea that China was open ended. It was you know there were things that you could offer them. There were ways to to that that they would improve and become a normal company. But uh, since 2011, it became clear that China was not headed to be a normal country. It was headed to be, uh, you know, the dictatorship that it is now. But I mean, you know, there, there are developments since then, just, uh, you know, ominous and, uh, and, and, and suggest that, uh, that China is moving in the direction of Germany in the 1930s. Sweet God, that's a very worrying thing. Um, they have a tremendous, uh, what, is it, what, is their, what is their military prowess in terms of uh, com Competing with the West or with the United States of America, or where do they stand in that sense of realpolitik, military capability to assert their their claim to a place in the sun on this planet? They have a big budget. Consider the Communist Party is the world, the Chinese Communist Party is the world's most powerful organization. Wow! It has an army. It's a political party that has an army. The government doesn't have, have an army. Mm -hmm. the, the party has the has the army. I want amazing, yeah. Yeah. So so uh, and it's an and and the party is opaque. We don't you know it's not it's a secretive organization. It runs like a gangster, basically under the same principles that it did in the night. In the uh, 1930s, when it was considered a kind Good of gang. God, is is that is that generally recognized among the people of the country? I mean, is it I generally never met, I never is met it anybody. Is it brought up in cultural circles or anything like that, or intellectual circles, or what is the discussion about the state of the nation kind of talk that we do here in the United States? I never met anybody in China who said his life's ambition was to be a Communist Party official. And so on. I never met I, I never met anybody had that kind of, that kind of ambition, you know. Uh, uh. However, I witnessed a conference with uh, among Chinese, not with foreigners, where there was a, quite a diversity, you know, uh, opposition expressed. I went to a conference about the Cultural Revolution, where people then based it that the, the you know what the party did during during those times. I, I was at a conference where there was a real estate investor who threatened that if the party was going to help the real estate sector, there's no reason why China can't have a political system like Sweden, you know, or, Sweden, or, or yeah. Sweden, you know, okay. uh, and, uh, and in a public forum with, with Chinese. So you're not going to hear that much anymore. That was allowed at the time, but things have tightened down considerably. So, uh, uh, so what do Chinese think? Everybody, Chinese are realistic. They, they, they believe there's corruption is fundamental and so on. But they, you know, rather than, rather than organize change, Chinese have a tendency to adapt and uh, put up with, uh, and learn to survive within the 
it, within the existing constraints until things become so unbearable that that whatever reaction there is is just out of control. So uh, you know, uh, uh, a runaway a runaway reaction of like an explosion. So um, so so now so so what Ch what the what what Chinese <coughs> want is continued economic growth. Yes. But if they don't get the economic growth, then eventually you reach a stage where you get economic give back. They, then there's a real problem. What is their military prowess? What is their military Oh, for the military prowess, prowess. yes. Oh, well, unlimited budget. Unlimited and budget budgets that, militarily? Sorry? Un, their military budget and their military uh, priorities uh, in terms of building a, a fighting force uh, in a military realpolitik sense. They want to build a military force to overcome anything the United States can offer. Okay. That, that, that's a pretty big challenge. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. So this is what's very, uh, you know, this is what's very disturbing. It's not like other countries, you know, where the military do their thing. They don't have an object, they don't have an objective to oppose up in, uh, any particular country and so on, or all the rest, or something. It's sort of, you know, middling type of, check of, uh, of objectives, accept the world system as it is, and do their thing, make their contribution, and so on, without, and nobody feels threatened by another country. But uh, the case of China, it's different. Well, it's a, it's a hell of a story, and unfortunately, uh, we're, we come to the end of this particular segment of the program. We'll take up another piece of it. But it's really incredibly interesting uh, view of that part of the world. And I thank you very much for being back here in the uh, United States of America and reporting us to it, uh, a clear understanding of what the reality is there. And I thank you very much for that, Bob. And uh, can you, well, let's stay tuned. We'll do another program to follow up on this, if you don't mind, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, Harold. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's, Thank you. We're talking here with Robert Bloom, our friend from way back a thousand years ago. We've been friends in, uh, in everything like that at uh, Columbia University. Thank you, for <coughs> Thank you for viewing this. The first two of two programs we're doing with him on uh, the situation, as he understands it, having been 10 years. And do you speak? Chinese fluently now? Yeah, pretty. I'm functional. Have you, got, have you got it down the the poetry and everything? Can you get no, down to no. the nuance? Can you get down to uh, all the <laughs> no, careful that, poetry? No, that, that's a, that's that's a lifetime commitment. Okay. Well, but, anyways, uh, anyway, uh, anyway, thanks. Functional. Thanks a lot for this. It's great pleasure, Bob. We're going to close this out for now. We'll come back and do a second uh, a second Good. hour, if that's okay. Okay. Just yep. stay tuned, everyone. Thank you very much. We'll be coming back with the second hour at a day following that you'll be viewing of this program. Thanks a lot. Okay, yep. thanks a lot for viewing. We'll look you straight in the eye, ladies and gentlemen. I've been listening to my friend across the world and everything, but thank you for viewing. We'll be coming back again soon. Okay. Okay, we can stop talking now because